My name is Daniel Luntala. I'm the, the president and founder of Whistler Technologies. Um, and I also have another company, Whistler Therapeutics, which has an outdoor um, farm here in Canada that we um, grow cannabis and make solventless extracts. So um, I'm coming at this and a lot of my intent for Whistler Technologies was just to make, you know, solventless extracts easier to make and, and less expensive for consumers so more people can enjoy them. So we're here to, to share our knowledge from the farming side and the processing side of, of what we can do to make the best extracts. And so we can help you all um, do well with your businesses or your, your personal grow. Yeah, this is our first webinar for the harvesting for solventless extraction. So thank you everybody who's uh, taken some time to come join us uh, for a chance to, to talk about this and uh, provide some education, shed some light on why uh, previously you may have had less luck uh, with your harvest and getting a good yield with solventless, or um, maybe just bumping up those yields a little bit if you've already had uh, you know a lot of good practice and a lot of good results. Maybe you pick up a couple tips in here uh, that really make the difference for your next runs. So introduction, I believe, uh, Dan, have you uh, done your full introduction there? Anything else to say? No, uh, I introduced myself, so you can go for it now. Sweet. So uh, yeah, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm a uh, pretty recent hire with Whistler Tech, came on uh, at the start of uh, 2022 now. Um, I've been working in the legal industry for uh, three or four years now, uh, mostly so uh, focusing on scaled production. Uh, most of my experience is in the solventless realm between uh, just providing uh, meds for myself as a medical patient and then uh, getting into the legal production and doing scaled production and stuff like that. And then I've also worked on uh, other extraction projects, looking at lab layouts and stuff like that for solvent extraction, but really where my passion lies is with solventless. So that's why I wanted to come to Whistler Technologies and just help build uh, the future of the industry on this side. So I'm excited to be here and excited to be talking to you guys today about uh, uh, the very start of this process and all of the crucial control points uh, that need to be considered when uh, you know processing uh, the biomass to get ready for extraction. So without further ado, we will dive right into our itinerary here. And so we've just done our introduction. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about pre-harvest prep and harvest planning, uh, then getting into harvesting procedures, bucking and deleafing procedures, bulk packaging and freezing, and then storage and transportation. We will uh, cap off the end of the presentation with a little uh, Q&A section, um, at which point um, uh, Dan and I will be referring to the chat uh, to look for questions submitted uh, during the talk as well as at the end. Uh, and we will do our best to answer all of your questions there. So um, don't be shy to throw some questions in the chat. Um, if we can address them at the time, we will do. Uh, but if not, we will uh, refer to those at the end. And then uh, you guys are also always welcome to email us um, if you wanted to follow up with anything. Um, so yeah, we'll get into it. So pre-harvest, Dan, did you want to kick us off here? Sure. So this is something that uh, we're, we're doing on, on our farm right now, um, defoliating prior to harvest. Um, a lot of the issues, um, harvesting especially at scale, is the amount of labor required to go through that material um, all at once. And so this is... Um, something that you can do to help the plants finish by removing some of the blockage of light on the trichomes, um, but also reduce your labor at harvest, not having to defoliate as much while you're bucking the plants um, and getting them ready for extraction. So we recommend one to two weeks um, before, um, and, and Andrew can let us know why, why would we want to do that before extraction and not uh, at, at the time. So uh, defoliating prior to harvest is really important because uh, it'll, it'll save a lot of time when you're going to, to buck and de-leaf once you've actually completed your harvest. It'll reduce a lot of the handling of the buds that you can handle. So, um, you know, just, you know, making sure to be careful when you're plucking those leaves off, as well as uh, when we're removing leaf matter and stuff, whether it's at harvest or while it's still on the plant, we're gonna be making little cuts uh, in the plant. And those are areas that um, if they're still open and exposed, when we go to salt extraction in the ice water, uh, the points that are going to leach a lot more chlorophyll out. Um, so we really are doing our best to reduce uh, the amount of chlorophyll getting released in the wash. It'll, it'll allow us to wash uh, for more cycles or for longer time, uh, depending on how you're doing your operation. 
And so um, that gives you longevity, better yields, and you're also less likely to get contaminant if uh, you know those incisions in the plant have had a chance to heal before it gets into the ice water. Um, so that's why we'd recommend definitely doing while that's on the plant. Uh, some people may prefer to do that while they're bucking and on a smaller scale, it might be easier. But uh, for us, we definitely find it's it's optimal to, to do that while it's on the plant. And then you don't have to worry about um, bottlenecks at that stage when you're uh, doing your bucking and deleafing. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So. Um, we talked about watching the weather. So for outdoor harvest, um, Andrew is asking before about when to harvest in Squamish and, and that's before it gets moldy. So um, it, even if your trichomes, you know, you should be inspecting them, um, making sure that you're going to harvest your your plants at the right maturity point. Um, but if you're an outdoor farmer and, and you can't, uh, um, you think you might, you know, be getting mold or you really need to harvest it, then then weather might take priority. Um, and, and, and then for the indoor growers um, and, and as well for the outdoor growers on the weather and the temperature, you don't want to change the temperature of the, the grow area to the harvest area too much uh, right at harvest. So you don't want to be taking plants from a cold field outside to a really warm room inside for the, for the bucking and, and processing. Um, they're going to wilt pretty fast and vice versa. If you're taking uh, plants from a hot grow room that's indoor, uh, into a, you know a much colder processing room, they can let off a lot of condensation, which can become an issue for the extraction. So matching the temperatures uh, at least somewhat between those areas is going to be helpful. Um, if you're harvesting in really warm temperatures, you have to be a lot more careful about um, the the plants getting uh, wilted and sticking together. And if it's really cold, you can knock off the trichomes really easily. Um, and then really planning your labor um, as an outdoor farm in the beginning of the season, when we have some small harvests of, of the auto flowers and the early plants, we're always uh, trying out new, new harvesters because you need skilled people and finding those skilled people and having them ready to come in is the biggest thing that you need um, if you have a large harvest going off uh, and especially in, in an outdoor setting when, when the timing of that is, uh, is, is variable. And that can be a lot of work to get that done. Um, but doing that before harvest can save yourself if you, if you need a whole bunch of good people all at once. Um, yeah. Uh, and then finally, I would say uh, if you can survive the weather or if you're indoor, um, using a microscope to inspect trico maturity is definitely uh, really important. Frenchy Cannoli was a really big speaker about this um, and ensuring trichome ripeness. And so what will happen is as we get into those later stages of flower, uh, with the genetics that are more suited towards solventless extraction, we will see um, an abscission start to form at the trichome head. So you'll see a little pinch point starting to form. And what you want to do is maybe take a few different random samples throughout different parts of your plant and look to make sure that you are seeing that pinch point on a majority of the trichomes uh, before you go to harvest if you can. Uh, because that abscission really makes it a lot easier to knock those heads uh, off of the plant without also removing, um, you know, stalks or little be bits of plant material uh, that will end up as contaminant in your final product. Um, so once again, that's, that's really more if you can. This is going to be more suited to the indoor guys uh, because at the end of the day, uh, your first priority is going to be making sure that your plant is clean of, of mold, bud rot, um, and other stuff like that. And, you know, if you are able to do that and get into those later, later seasons of harvest, then, you know, start inspecting those trichomes and, and make sure that a majority of them uh, have that pinch point. You will find um, different genetics will amber the trichomes differently and just seek to more focus on that pinch point rather than the color of the trichomes. Um, because that, that, that pinch point is really what we're looking for to, to make sure we can get those those heads knocked off there so um yeah so we'll move into uh harvesting and uh the processes that go along with that so i'll uh, i'd say just starting off we really want to reduce the number of touch points uh when we're harvesting and pulling those plants off of the field uh every time we're touching and handling those buds we're more likely to damage trichomes even bruise the 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 flowers themselves um, so what some people might like to do is, is harvest whole plants and hang those and then wheel a rack over to the processing area. Um, another great tip that Dan was telling me about 
uh, is to cut individual branches and then stack those vertically um, in a tote or in a bin or something, even you know five gallon buckets if you have to. But by stacking um, everything vertically and sort of putting stuff stem down, you're not laying buds uh, over one another and uh, the ones at the bottom aren't gonna be getting squished. Everything's still gonna be standing up and uh, you know just being handled gently. Yeah, I'll, I can add on to that. Um, you know, reducing the number of touch points also reduces the time and your labor cost in this process. So the, these are all win-win wins. And if you have an unorganized team and, and a poor process, you can be spending two or three times as much on harvesting or miss out on some of your field. So having a process that's really dialed in and thinking about how am I gonna get this from the plant into wherever I'm storing it or processing it as simply and as quickly as possible. So, um, and this is also matching your teams. You wanna have, you don't wanna have bottlenecks and have all this material that's being cut cut down, but then is taking forever to process and it's sitting in bins for, for four hours. So that's gonna degrade your quality and you don't want the you know um people to have to do too many tasks so what we like to do in the field is cut branches off of the plant have the stem ready to go into a bucking machine or ready to be um hand bucked and as andrew said putting those in the bin with the stem facing up so the next person pulls out the stem and the and it's already in the position they need to buck or put into the bucking machine um and only two people have touched that um plant um, some people cut down full plants and then bring them to another area and then have people breaking them down and then doing the bucking. And this just adds extra steps. Try and leave as much as you plant of the plant as you can in the ground or in your beds um, and, and just take off what needs to be harvested um, and deal with cutting down the stalks when you're prepping for your next round. Um, uh, you want to make sure that you you know you're not reducing bottlenecks so having someone on your team who is doing kind of multiple tasks they might be doing cutting down branches um or they might be bucking or they might be bagging just to make sure there's no bottlenecks so making sure you have people that are watching over that flow of material and not letting it sit too long ideally you cut down a a, a branch and it might sit for an hour or two max before it gets into um uh the freezer and that's really ideal. You don't want to have material that's cut in 8 a.m. And, and hasn't been processed when people are going for their lunch break at noon. It's going to have wilted and it's going to have reduced the quality. So as soon as you see that plant starting to wilt, like your lettuce is no longer nice and crispy in the fridge, um, that's when it sat too long. And you want to try and reduce seeing that, that wilted plant material and get it from, from the plant to wherever it's going before that happens. Um, and, and obviously, you want to avoid creating contamination along the way. Um, Andrew has a great tip on on, on uh, outdoor clothing for, for producers. Why don't you go over that, Andrew? Yeah, so um, the first thing I'd like to add on to is uh, a big issue with wilting is if that material is wilting, that's that plant material dying. If you're then going to go wash that, um, you're definitely going to be a lot more likely to, uh, to get chlorophyll in your water. It's going to reduce your wash times, as well as uh, your hash is likely to end up with a swampy flavor, and nobody wants that. Um, so really, you know, I think the goal with Solventless is to, is to produce as high of a quality product as you can. And um, that's definitely not what we're looking for. So um, and then, yeah, as Dan mentioned, moving on into sort of PPE and what you can wear, uh, reducing the amount of like fibrous clothing you can wear, uh, you know, whether it's an old sweater, uh, you know, uh, hats that may be uh, coming out with fibers all over the place, um, you know, making sure to wear hairnets. Um, a really nice piece of clothing that I like to wear is like a rain jacket or a windbreaker. Um, you know, depending on what temperature, I have a really light uh, windbreaker that's, you know, just really thin. It's not too warm. And then if it is a little bit colder, just getting a, a bit of a thicker rain jacket. But having um, more of those sort of nylon clothing, uh, there's not going to be fibers coming off of them. Pet hairs and other stuff are going to be more likely to stick onto them. I definitely recommend having a lint roller on site. Just always make sure you're doing your best to keep yourself clean because uh, that'll reduce the risk of, of getting more contaminants into that product. Of course, um, you know, if you're on a smaller farm, you have dogs, uh, maybe trying to keep the dogs outside of that fenced area of the, the, the cultivation area while you're harvesting is really key. Um, and that's, you know, probably just something to keep in mind all year, to be honest. Um, 
and then further on even just making sure that you're you're cleaning your tools keeping everything sanitized um is really just gonna help you know have those those points of control that is going to reduce getting contaminant into your final product because once it gets in there once it's stuck to the trichomes uh you know the only way that you might get it off is if it you know moves its way through the bags anything that's going to be the same sizes of trichomes that's going to end up in your hash and that's you know the only way to avoid that is just by taking care uh earlier on so uh and, dan uh, do you have anything else to add yeah well you want to avoid dust as well for us oh, on, on the outdoor farm yeah. we have uh we have a lot of you know if it's dry it's going to be quite dusty um and making sure people don't drive faster than than you know five kilometers an hour um yeah. will stop dust production um and then planning beforehand this is a field from our farm and we had some cover crop in between the plants so that there was some uh you know residue there that people weren't kicking up dust when they were going to harvest so you know yeah. you can always if you have a really dusty field put down some hay or do something that's going to stop that being created when you're going at harvest um and really making sure people drive slowly on the farm um yeah. otherwise you can kick up a lot of dust and, and obviously ruin it for those plants and that kind of goes all year long um yeah i think that's everything for harvesting yeah. um well, we'll, you know, uh, and this is yeah go on andrew yeah, I was, yeah, you know, these are all pointers and, and everything we're saying may not may not always apply to your specific situation. Um, and that's something we can definitely talk about uh, in the questions section. If you guys want to bring up your uh, specific situations, we can talk about that. Uh, but we'll move into uh, bucking and uh, trimming. And so um, I would say starting off, it's really important to maintain um, an ideal processing area environment. As we mentioned earlier, uh, reducing temperature fluctuations uh, between your harvest and processing area is really ideal. If you're going from, you know, let's say you're indoor or it's been really warm uh, near the end of your harvest season and you're going into a really cold processing area, you might be more likely to get condensation that forms on stuff. Um, that's not going to be ideal. You're going to be at a mold risk uh, if that's left to sit, um, especially like throughout the day and stuff. So we want to want to reduce that. Um, if you can work in maybe a more chilled area because um, your harvest was in a colder environment, that's great. Like Dan said, not going from a cold area into a super warm area um, that, you know, there will be wilting and stuff. So just keeping in mind that processing area environment and as well, once again, just keeping everything clean as possible, uh, having air filters in the room, making sure that your room is uh, clean before you start. Uh, and then also just getting cleaned up throughout the day. Uh, it doesn't hurt to, you know, just be cleaning up that table, especially when everybody goes for lunch. Just get rid of all those leaves, get those bagged, get those out of the room, sanitize all your tables, sanitize all your tools. And especially in between batches, I definitely recommend that. Some genetics, some areas of the farm might be more prone to mold than other areas. So if you can reduce that cross contamination, that's also great. And that'll lead to, uh, you know, a more successful final product. So, so the there's a lot of, um, you know, question about should we be hand bucking or machine bucking? So for, for someone who is good with their scissors, the hand bucking is always going to give a nicer material for the end uh, extraction. Having just one cut on the bud and that takes it off the stem and that goes into your extraction uh, it is going to be ideal. But then that doesn't go for everybody. People who have very large uh, operations probably aren't going to find the labor or don't want to make the spend to just pay for hand bucking and they're making a, a you know, a different quality product. So if you've got a, a really high quality grow you're doing and you're trying to make the best hash possible, you should probably be hand bucking that to get to that stage. If you've got 10 acres to harvest, you're probably using a machine. Um, and depending on, you know, the stage of your harvest, that's how much care is taken. Are you, are you taking off all of the leaves before bucking or just taking everything out at once? So if you are using machine buckers, uh, as I talked about before, having the harvest staff who are cutting the plants prep it for bucking is incredibly important and can really increase your throughput um, a, a significant amount, you know, 50 to 100 percent more harvest if you have your team that know how the bucking machine works. If they're just cutting down branches at random and throwing them in a bin, people are taking them out of the bin at the bucking machine and having to cut them up and put them into the right size holes. 
people in the field or harvesting from your room should be cutting the plants so that the stem has two inches free so it goes into the bucking machine and as we said it goes into the bin with the stem up and the person in front of the bucking machine can just pull stems out of the bucket and stick them into the machine without ever looking at the bucket or ever thinking about the plant if they're getting these branches that all have sort of a bunch of sub branches those don't do well in the bucking machine you have to break it down to to single branches anything on a branch that's over two or three inches is going to get caught up in the bucking machine tear up your stem and now you've got a whole bunch of shit that you have to clean up or gets into your extraction and brings down that quality so we have to be really careful that we're breaking down the plants properly to go into the bucking machine um and and that prep in the field is going to save you a lot of time and increase the quality of your hash if you are using a a, a bucking machine. And so um, prepping that material for going in, um, if you've got the time, uh, removing all of the fan leaves that's going to go in there uh, is going to make that end product really nice. Um, but cutting the stems properly and providing them for the person using the bucking machine is really good. Switching through your staff so everybody's used the bucking machine and understands what works and what doesn't work will really help. And then they, they cut the plants properly. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's everything I had for, for that. Um, Andrew, yeah, yeah, I'd, you can, I'd say uh, that just sort of rings us back into obviously the importance of that material preparation. Um, if you were preparing your material effectively, in your deleafing uh, prior to harvest, and you are harvesting in an effective manner, that's when we obviously see those things sort of making the stars align in the bucking and trimming process. Uh, because at all stages, we really want to make life as easy as possible for people. You don't want to be rushing this process if possible. Uh, when people are rushing, they're going to take less care. Um, and as such, uh, you likely end up with a lower quality product. So. Um, you know, really just organizing that that ideal process flow from uh, harvest into bucking and trimming, and then making sure your bucking and trimming room is organized efficiently. People aren't having to move all the way across the room to get stuff over to the next station. Uh, you know, some people might prefer an assembly line kind of formation. Others might prefer a horseshoe that sort of loops back around to the front of the, the area, um, whatever it may be. Um, just making sure that you're you're well organized, you're reducing those bottlenecks wherever possible. This is sort of the last stage that you have in terms of material handling um, to ensure that your product is going to be um, perfect going into that extraction process. Once it's frozen, there's not really much you can do. We definitely don't want to thaw out that material. Um, probably also don't want to have to worry about uh trying to work on that material in a freezer your employees are obviously not going to like that um so really just trying to keep things as efficient as possible um and that is something that we do offer consulting on if you guys need um just you know helping you guys with your room layouts and knowing what equipment is where um training protocols and stuff like that so um that is something we are always able to to help out with if you guys need and yeah so we will move on into packaging and freezing so uh this part of the stage is really really important um because as i said uh this is sort of where you're going to be at your final steps before you're getting into your extraction and um making sure that your buds are frozen properly is going to be another crucial step um if this is done improperly uh you can end up with uh significantly reduced yields um and so on which we'll touch on and so uh as we uh have shown on the slide there i think ideally um we could flash freeze the buds if that's possible um that's not an option for everybody flash freezers are expensive especially at the scale that you might need um if you're working on a farm so the next best option is to have a walk-in freezer and freezing your buds on baking trays so you can look at getting uh baking trays line those with parchment if you wish and then uh getting baker's racks that hold 20 to 25 of those trays if you can just freeze your buds in the open air uh, it reduces any condensation that might form on those if condensation is forming and freezing before the bud freezes it'll actually kill uh, those cells that are getting frozen and those end up wilting and degrading which once we get into the ice water extraction process um you know we'll end up leaching out more chlorophyll lend to those swampier flavors in the hash and the rosin which is something we're definitely trying to avoid. 
So um, freezing on trays, really um, probably the most ideal for most people uh, who don't have the budget for flash freezers or don't have the opportunity to use one. And then finally, if we're if you are um, you know going to be freezing in bags, uh, one tip that was taught to me uh, from Dan and from others is that uh, keeping those bags open uh, while the buds fully freeze through. So uh, 24 to 48 hours, keeping those bags open, it'll allow the moisture to escape from the bag instead of collecting on the buds, freezing on the buds before we get frozen. And then, like I said before, if condensation is forming and freezing on those buds, it will kill uh, a lot of plant cells, which end up uh, degrading and wilting on the plant. And, you know, once again, that ends up uh, affecting the quality of your uh, final products there. So it's definitely something to avoid. And you also need to take into account, you know, how you're going to be storing this material uh, once it is frozen. And, and one point that we kind of skipped over here is you don't need to freeze. If you're able to match your extraction capacity to the harvest from your field, now you don't have to freeze the material. And that, and then you don't have any plant cells freezing. You have less contaminant coming out of the material. So you could be harvesting your room, throwing everything into, you know, your craft plus uh, from us, and you'll be able to harvest it or harvest all the trichomes um, without freezing the material. And I've seen some amazing hash made that way because it hasn't broken down. Um, and so, you know, uh, our machine can do 160 kilos in an eight hour shift. And if you're an outdoor producer, you could be doing, you know, over 400 kilos in 24 hours. So um, th that's always a possibility, but obviously logistically, it's a hard for a lot of people to, to harvest and, and then process everything right away. So freezing is what we do for logistics, basically to store that material. Now, if you're going to be storing it um, in, in big totes, um, you might break a lot of that material after it's frozen on trays. You need to handle it carefully so you're not going to smash up all that frozen material and now create a whole bunch of broken pieces of leaf which make contaminant. So if you are freezing on trays, you want to more gently take it off into bins and probably not go over 5 or 10 kilos of cannabis in a bin. Um, freezing in bags, uh, with them open, you know, it's not quite as good. You get a bit of condensation in there. But one thing that's nice is the, the material kind of, you know, freezes together somewhat that you can stack those bags in a super sack, let's say, um, and you're not going to break apart that material so much. Um, so depending on what you have to store your cannabis in, you want to think about how you're going to be freezing it and how you're going to be packaging that um, because you don't want to handle it too much, knock off the trichomes, break apart leaf matter. Yeah, exactly. As Dan mentioned, yeah, anything we can do avoid to, to create contaminant um, really has to be kept in mind. And uh, it'll just help, uh, re really help in ensuring uh, the quality of that final product and the efficiency of your extraction as well. Um, we really want to ensure uh, we can get the maximum yield that is possible. And so by following all these steps, reducing spots where trichomes can get knocked off or can contaminate can get added into the product is really important to keep in mind. Um, I'll always go in for this. Mark uh, Mark asked just if we need to refrigerate the buds, if we're going to uh, do them fresh. Um, and uh, if you have some ice, I think you just add more ice to your tank. Um, our Craft Plus can be glycol chilled. You can pull that uh, temperature down really easily. I don't think you need to refrigerate them. I think that lends to them wilting before they get to the tank. You're probably better off getting them to the extraction tank as fast as possible and just putting a bit of ice in there to keep it uh, cold um, yeah. once it gets going. I think that energy transfer into the uh, flower uh, to, to get it cold from the ice water should happen pretty quickly once you've got everything submerged. So I think Dan is right. I'm not so sure that uh, refrigeration would be necessary. So, uh, but we will move into um, our final section before questions is uh, storage and transportation. And so um, I've definitely found the ideal storage environment to sort of be around that negative 20 degrees Celsius. It's um, cold enough that it keeps everything frozen um, and nice, but not so cold that you're going to risk uh, issues such as freezer burn um, and uh, and other stuff. I think freezing in a minus 40 or minus 80 freezer 
is just unnecessary and it'll also make your plant material very brittle um so if it's you know brittle and it's being uh stored it's likely uh that plant material is going to break and degrade and once again that is going to lend into getting more contaminant into the product and then uh actually another thing i wanted to touch on that we didn't mention in the packing and freezing is um making sure not to vacuum seal anything um unless dan did you touch on that no i didn't yeah you want to you want to pack it uh loosely yeah exactly so we just want to make sure whether we're packing in bags or whatever that those are loosely packed the bags still have a lot of air in them when they get sealed uh that'll help cushion it just like a bag of chips right um whereas if we're vacuum sealing the ba the the bags come down tight on the product um that can break and crush trichomes and one thing that is a huge no-no that i have seen some people do is before their product is even frozen while it's still wet and fresh they're vacuum sealing it and then throwing it into the freezer like that and that is just a recipe for disaster your butt is going to freeze into these bricks they're going to be hard to break apart you can think about um you know how soft uh those trichomes are when everything is fresh before they get frozen um you're just going to be crushing everything together likely um probably almost doing like a wet press on the material likely going to leach out uh some chlorophyll some other plant juices and stuff um just not definitely not what we want um so just making sure if you are going to use vacuum seal bags just don't use your vacuum option just seal those bags leave some air in them uh and, and allow some room for for breathing and cushioning yeah and if you're a processor and you know you end up with a bag something happened to um and and it ends up frozen in a, in a block um it's nice just to stick that into your agitation tank and let it thaw in there instead of trying to smash it all up and breaking up all the buds and having more contaminant um so if you are having to do you know remediation on on somebody's uh poor packing take that block of frozen cannabis and just put it into the water and then let it break apart slowly in there yeah and then so i guess uh, the next point we want to touch on is storage organization uh so making sure that uh your your storage is effectively organized um because that'll allow you to go in and pick and choose what you want to process um otherwise you know you're sort of going to be stuck uh to just picking out what's available as well as if you are uh you know working in, in a more licensed and regulated operation uh where you might get it be getting audited um, it's important to be able to access and count all those things because if you have to remove everything from your freezer to just be able to access stuff and count it as soon as you've removed it from your freezer it's going to start to thaw um, it is you know of the utmost importance to avoid thawing if that frozen plant material thaws uh, as it's thawing all of those plant cells that were then frozen uh, are now just going to basically start dying um, and then once again you're going to end up with this sort of product that's starting to ferment and um you know just getting wet and it'll once again as i've mentioned a hundred times already you're gonna end up with a swampy flavor in your hash and that's just something we we really need to avoid there so um dan any other points for storage organization um yeah i mean if you have to, you can just keep filling up your 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 con your reefer container, which we had to do once, and then it was first in, first out, and you just have a wall of cannabis there. Um, and if you want to try and get to anything, you're having to move it around. Um, you you can look at having different options. Um, we we've had now a, a pallet and and a pallet that will stack um, like six boxes on different levels, and then having ten kilos in each box. Um, you can put bags into super sacks. Um, and if you have two stacks of super sacks in, in a, in a 40 foot reefer, you can have 4,000 kilos fresh frozen in there, but then it's hard to reach anything. So you have to think about that when you're planning how much storage space you have. Um, if you want to be able to access anything at any time, um, you're probably going to need twice as much storage as if you're just stacking it completely full. And, and then the last bit is never stack bags that aren't completely frozen yet. If you're freezing in bags, we let them freeze open for 24 to 48 hours until they're hard. And at that point, you can stack those frozen bags in a super sack and get maybe 125 to 150 kilos in a super sack. Um, we've had people make a mistake where they stack bags that aren't frozen yet 
um, and then they just crush each other in the weight and you end up with those frozen blocks of cannabis. So making sure everything is completely frozen before it goes into the long-term storage. So you want to plan out, this is where I'm doing my pre-freezing, making sure everything is ready for storage, then it goes into storage. Even if you're going straight into bags, you want to have that checkpoint where the bags sit. We usually set, let them sit at least 48 hours in the reefer until they're nicely frozen. Um, and then we will stack them away for long-term storage. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I guess finally we'll talk a little bit about uh, the transportation alternate extraction sites. Dan, I think that's something you uh, definitely have more experience with than I. Um, so why don't you talk about that? Yeah, well, if you're doing long term or long distance um, transport, you definitely want a negative 20 reefer truck and, and maybe ask for some some references because I've had stories some horror stories where people make a shipment and it arrives thawed um from the logistics supplier so that your that your transportation companies make sure that they're gonna have it arrive frozen and have the proper storage so if you're shipping a you know uh you know and it's gonna be longer than um a day's travel make sure that that's gonna be negative 20 the whole time uh for us we transport uh, right now about four hours to a processing site um, and that's done in, in a kind of sprinter van with a with a reefer in it. And that only goes to maybe negative four to negative 10, depending how cold it is outside. So we can turn our reefer down to negative 30 or negative 35, get the material in there really cold, um, and then pack it in that um, smaller van and take it down. Um, negative 20 is ideal, um, but I wouldn't recommend um, transferring stuff in those small vans that only go to negative four um, long distances or in hot temperatures because their reefers really aren't that powerful and they can thaw. Um, but if you've frozen your material to, to negative 30, um, we've had the reefer fail and we just had it all kind of insulated each other and it made it there in four hours without thawing. So on those small trips, you can use those other vans, but um, I wouldn't trust them for, for long distance travel. You want to get a carrier who can do the negative 20 transport. Um, yeah. Sweet. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll also add to that. Um, you know, if you're a uh, cultivator and you're just looking to send smaller samples, you can do that in the regular post. Uh, would definitely recommend doing that via overnight. And then if you pack your box uh, with some dry ice and ideally maybe in a styrofoam cooler, dry ice on the bottom, little layer of cardboard um, just for a bit of separation and then putting your, uh, you know, let's say one or three kilogram samples on top of that, sealing that up. If you send that overnight, um, I have received product from across the country. As long as it was shipped on dry ice, uh, it was fine. It still arrived frozen. It was a little bit softer, like maybe the biomass had come down to about maybe minus four, um, but it was still frozen. There was no degradation or anything. Um, so that's an option if you're looking to vet uh, potential extraction uh, partners and stuff like that. And uh, obviously you don't want to send them a full batch right away. Uh, that gives you the ability to, to send a smaller amount um, just through the regular mail without having to figure out all of the logistics right away. So, And, and if you're sending test samples and you need a micro test, um, you make sure that they arrive still on dry ice and get the lab to report you the sample temperature arrival. Um, because we've seen it where there is some failure in the post. They didn't tell us the samples arrived late. They sent a micro test and there's like 5 million CFUs and we're like, what is going on? And then we see that the sample arrived at 20 Celsius and had been thawed and, and like, you know, fermenting for a few days. So make sure that those test samples plan the overnight, um, you know, get five pounds of dry ice in an insulated box and send your test samples and make sure that the lab has a procedure for fresh samples. And they're not just taking your frozen samples and leaving them on the counter for six hours for them to thaw before they do the micro testing. So, you know, if you're sending samples for testing with frozen biomass, um, make sure that you're, uh, you're doing that. For in-house processing, we don't usually um, uh, test flowers for, for micro. Um, but some, you know, in the Canadian system, a lot of companies don't want to have any, um, or in the U S have take material from a grower into a processor without that micro test. Um, so, so make sure that, you know, your material hasn't thawed when that test was taken, um, because that's going to give a result that's, that's not accurate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that pretty much brings us to the end here. Uh, we're ready to get into the Q and A and stuff. 
Um, I am just going to exit out of the presentation because I cannot see uh, any of the chat, and I would definitely like to participate in the Q&A there. Uh, so just quickly before I cancel out, um, if anybody uh, wants to get in touch with Dan or I, our emails are just Andrew or Daniel at whistlertechnologies.ca. Uh, you can also contact us at the info at whistlertechnologies.ca email. Uh, our phone number is 604-962-120. Um, and then you can find us on Instagram at, uh, at whistlertech there. Um, so once again, if you guys want to follow up with anything, more questions, want to chat with us, Maybe you want to buy a, you know, Craft Plus. Uh, we are there to support you through that. Uh, so uh, don't hesitate to reach out there. And uh, once again, thank you, everybody, for, uh, you know, taking the time to come join us. Yeah, thanks again, everyone. Um, you know, we, we do, we're very active with the plant and making hash. So, you know, we really help um, all of our customers, uh, whether they're buying equipment or just consulting um, with their operation, making the best products possible. Um, I think Marcus Richardson, the bubble man himself, is in this room too. Um, and he also works with us. And, and so we've got a lot of experience making hash and that's what we give to our customers. And I'm gonna turn on everybody's microphone and everyone's video. If you want, you can ask a question um, on your mic or ask a question in the chat and we'll just have a, an open Q&A period for a bit. Maybe, maybe Dan, instead of just turning everybody's mics on, if people have questions, we can turn on their microphones individually. I, I don't know if I can do that. I think I have to turn on every let people have mics right now. Okay. Sweet. But everyone started off muted. So, um, you know, if you want to ask a question and it's quiet, go for it. Or you can make a comment in the chat and we'll um, invite you up. And just really you quick. Chat as well. If you want a question, use the chat and we'll answer them as they come. Yeah. Uh, a couple more things. As Carolina just posted in our chat, we do have a blog section. Tons of useful information in there. Uh, those blogs are written by myself, Dan. Uh, other members of our team as well. A uh, lot of really useful information. And first question I wanted to answer was Jason Ellis there asking us um, about the fresh frozen he's just packaged into his freezer. I will say on smaller scales, uh, I was before I learned about that tip of leaving bags open, I was always just closing my bags. I think on a smaller scale, it's definitely going to cause less of an issue. Um, there's a lot less biomass going in there. I think really where the issue sits is when uh, with those larger quantities that take longer to freeze down. Uh, we really want to avoid uh, closing those bags too early. As best, best practice, you should always follow that. Uh, but in this instance, I do think you'll be all right. Uh, yeah. Just run that material into your ice water extraction and have a great time and uh, make some great hash there. So, yeah. We, we've, we've frozen a lot of bags um, with... Uh, that were closed too early um, and it processed, um, we made some great rosin out of it, um, but it might've been a little grassier um, th than it could have been. So it's definitely not gonna ruin it. You're still gonna be able to make great hash, um, but if you wanna, you know, be take it to the next level, these are all tips that are just gonna take it a bit further. And when you add up all those tips together, um, you might notice a really big jump in quality. Um, so we had a question about freezing on the shelves or, and flash freezing and in the totes. Um, the, the, you know, if you have freezing in a tote, you don't have enough room for trays, which is totally fair. Um, probably don't fill it too much in the tote. I wouldn't have it compacting cannabis on the bottom, maybe max like six or eight inches of, of cannabis in that tote would be ideal for freezing in. Um, you could like put a layer, let it freeze and then put another layer on top of that. If you want to fill that tote completely, but I wouldn't fill the tote completely and then just freeze straight in there. Um, that's a lot of material for, for that size of tote. Michael, anybody can reach out to us on our website or email us um, for a quote. So thank you. Thank you, Angelo, for the kind words. Yeah, we definitely uh, do try to be uh, leaders in this space and uh, are always constantly uh, working to improve and innovate our equipment and as well as uh, do little things like this to provide education for those people who might either be using our equipment or are making a product that will get processed in our equipment. And by learning these little tips and tricks, we can make sure everybody is uh, um, trying to do that the, the best they can and make the best products possible. So Robert asked, if, if you're harvesting an indoor room, do you drop your temperature before harvest? How long before harvest do you recommend? Well, some people start dropping temperatures 
you know, um, maybe weeks before harvest, that might pull out some purple colors on your plant. We oh, see sure. on, on the acorn farm, we see a lot of purples come out when it gets cold. Um, but then, you know, it really in the last few days, you can drop it down um, so that it's maybe in, if you're running at 28, it goes down to 20 and it's closer to where you're going to harvest. Some people have rooms that they can freeze the plants while it's in the ground and you can drop it down. So, um, you know, how far you drop it down is really dependent on what you're planning to do and what your room capability has. But at least dropping it down to the same temperature as your process room is going to help a lot at, at harvest. And uh, I'll also touch on that a little bit. I know um, back when I was doing indoor growing and stuff, one thing I was a big fan of was uh, uh, getting into those uh, last two, three weeks of flowers, starting to dial back my lights by reducing the light. I was reducing the heat in the room. And I do find it, it allows the trichomes to harden off a little bit. And uh, with that, they were a lot easier to remove. And I started getting really great results doing that. Um, there, there was definitely a different terpene profile as well. I suspect that uh, you, there was less evaporation of more volatile terpenes. That's just the hypothesis. Um, but yeah, once again, starting to reduce those temperatures, uh, getting as low as, um, you know, maybe 20 degrees Celsius uh, instead of the 28 that I was running with, uh, with the LEDs. Uh, so really by, by making a noticeable reduction in that temperature, I was uh, getting... Um, better abscission points in my trichomes and as such i was getting better yields and uh better quality as well and jay thank you uh for the amazing event at the unicorn cup you put on um and he just asked how many hours um to freeze product before it starts to lose quality great question really depends on the temperature you're at room temperature probably two hours if it's 35 out maybe one hour or less um if you're harvesting and it's 10 out then you might have four hours, but you just got to see for your plant. It will change plant to plant uh, and strain to strain, depending on, um, you know, how, how it affects in the heat. Um, so, you know, um, you, you kind of have to figure that out, but um, you know, general rule an hour is best. That should be best for, for most temperatures. Um, but when it's really cold out, we've seen stuff stay fine, you know, even for four or six hours. Yeah. see trying to think if there's any other tips and tricks of things i've picked up along the years um i i honestly think a, a really big thing uh, for me that that i learned had to learn the hard way was was really just avoiding uh, the thawing of that biomass i'll never forget um the smell of swamp water when i, I what had happened was uh, i had some some cannabis a friend had given me it was in my freezer uh, we were doing some renovations in the basement. Uh, the freezer got unplugged to do some work on the electrical, never got plugged back in, went to go start my process the next day. Everything was thawed out. So I just turned the freezer back on, froze everything back. Uh, and when I say thawed, like it was wet in those bags, like it was, it was fully thawed. Um, and then when, uh, you know, once it was frozen back, uh, I waited another 24 hours for that, went to go process it. And I was just like, this is not right um you know it, it 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 just smells like 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 an off green tea um <laughs> and so uh if you're an outdoor farmer and you've got four thousand kilos in a reefer and it's on a generator that's a stressful stressful point for all of us when the generator breaks down and you're like i need to find another generator in the next 24 hours before all of my cannabis turns to swamp water so making sure you've got reliable equipment um and hopefully you know we eventually got ours hooked up to the electricity um there are phase converters you can switch single phase to three phase to run the the reefers um we can help anyone with that kind of setup as well um so you want to make sure you have uh, good equipment and literally someone and, and an alarm we have an alarm in our freezer that's a physical thermometer and if it goes under 15 celsius it sends an alarm to an alarm system and somebody calls us to say your reefer is getting warm so um you do not want your product to thaw and set yourself up for for safe measures to make sure that that doesn't happen yeah um any other questions you guys and we had a question in the chat on leds um if they're better for your plants um have you had any experience um, so john yeah i will be honest when doing indoor cultivation i've only ever used leds i'm a young guy um, so that was sort of what was coming up uh, as I started getting into growing, um, 
you know, I would say if you can dial in your LEDs properly, um, LEDs are better than HPS, and I'm sure I'll catch some flack for that, but it's just true, guys. I'm sorry. Um, and so, uh, yeah, with the LEDs, you get a lot better control of, uh, like, the dimness of your lights. With HPS, if you try dimming them back, it actually changes the spectrum. So with LEDs, you get better control uh, over how much light is being put out and how much heat. Uh, so with that, you can sort of tune... Um, you can you can tune your environment a little bit better. And I think because of my ability to tune that environment, I was able to get a better product out of it. Um, that's not to say you can't make great hash and rosin with HPS, uh, but in my opinion, LED is definitely the way to go um, if you're really trying to push the envelope and, and get the highest quality product you can. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I, I only I only say that because because uh, uh, we uh, we make our own LEDs and we sell them here, right? So that's kind of one of the th things I kind of latched onto is because you, you know we do have the control over it. So we have found with increasing our trichrome yield and the ones for our dumpers, we like all our plants are on the LEDs now, right? And we just find we yeah. a little bit better that way. Yeah, totally, dude. Yeah, I think I, it really is just that 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 finer control you have over your environment. Um, and yeah, hundred percent. I think I think LED would be the way to go. Um, and Robert asked how long, how many cycles can you recycle your hash water? Um, you know, I don't know if anyone's taken that to the end. We've recycled it for maybe four batches before, and and usually when it starts to get tough to tougher to pull the bubble bags is when we would start re, uh, changing over the water. Yeah, I would um, say Robert, it, it's really going to be up to you and what kind of products you're looking to make. For me. Uh, especially for those consumer grade rosins and stuff, I would never be using reusing my water batch to batch, um, just because as the chlorophyll starts to leach out, um, that is going to affect the quality of your hash. And uh, you know, it does get to a point where no amount of rinsing uh, during the collection will get rid of that. So by reducing um, or by you know ensuring a, a higher quality of water that you're starting out with um the better that process is going to be in my opinion um and yeah once again i think uh, i've tried to touch on this many times we really want to avoid um getting that green coloration into the hash uh because it will show in the hash it shows in the rosin uh and you can taste it as well and so for uh a, you know that's not going to be desirable for people and it's it's a good way um you know just to avoid that is is just by by using clean water I know some guys that go as far as uh, if they're doing a run and dump, they use fresh water every single time they restart their cycle. Um, I don't know of anybody doing continuous flow where they are draining their water and consistently adding new water into the process. I think that could be really interesting. Um, but yeah, typically I would just be using uh, one, one batch of water per batch of extraction. Yeah, and you know what? I think if you're doing like a food grade product or something, if you're in an area where water is, is hard to get, maybe you're in a drought, um, at the end of the day, you have to do uh, what you have to do to, to make your product, right? So maybe um, if you are in a, you know, a month span of time where you have to be reusing all of that water, uh, keeping your process as cold as possible at all times will reduce how much that uh, chlorophyll leaches into the water. So that'll keep your water as clean for as long as possible. And once again, by following these tips and making sure you have an ideal input and reducing how much chlorophyll is leaking into that water, then yeah, maybe you can start reusing that water over and over. Um, it just sort of depends on what kind of product you're, you're trying to make. And yeah, Mark is right. You, you could likely uh, purify the water um, uh, after it's been processed. It's, not, it's something we're, we're looking into, uh, but we don't have a, a ton of factual info on just yet. All right, anything else? Um, yeah, you know, any kind of filtration you can do if you are looking to reuse that water would be ideal. All right, okay, guys. Well, I think uh, we might um, take this to a close. You can see uh, all of the links that uh, Carolina has shared. So we'll uh, just leave those up for a minute or two um you know be sure to to bookmark those channels 
uh, if you uh, you know want to uh, to be able to reference them if uh, if if you need. So. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Feel free to reach out to any of us if yeah, you want. Thank you, guys. You know, um, we we all just want to provide an educational experience for the, the hash community and keep pushing all of this forward. So uh, thank you to everybody for doing what you're doing, for being part of this industry. And uh, let's just keep everything moving forward.